Chapter 36, these are the inflammatory, infectious, and structural disorders, so namely endo, myo, and pericarditis. Then we'll move on to valvular disorders, rheumatic heart disease, and cardiomyopathy. The concepts involved in infective endocarditis are perfusion because this thing causes heart failure and uh, the nature is an infection. So there is infection and perfusion. Because it's an infection, so you have to bring in your chain of infection concept here. So let's start with how did this uh, happen? How did the infection get to the endocardium? The endocardium, of course, is the innermost lining of the heart. If you look at the portals of entry here, these are the, the causes. So if you, number one cause, uh, risk factor is the prior endocarditis, meaning you've had one before. That means, how did you get it? You most probably had the other risk factor. So having one increases the, the risk of having another one. Prosthetic valves, whether it's... Um, a valve repair, a damaged valve, or a prosthetic valve, meaning you have valve damage, which is not repaired yet, uh, or if the valve was repaired, or even if the valve was replaced with a prosthetic valve, these are risk factors for endocarditis again. If the patient has a rheumatic heart disease, that's another condition. If you have a pacemaker, Marfan syndrome is a genetic connective tissue disorder wherein the connective tissues are abnormal, they're soft. Um, anyway, and then cardiomyopathy, which is um, heart disease. This is an abnormally shaped heart which can be acquired or sometimes you um, uh, develop it from malnutrition, the alcoholism also. It can also be induced by pregnancy. Non-cardiac conditions, if you have a blood infection, so let's say you caught something in the hospital and IV drug abuse, uh, because we, you know, our IV drug users don't always use sterile needles or, or not practice the best aseptic technique while injecting IV drugs. And then finally, if you have uh, invasive lines, uh, particularly central lines, okay, these are all of risk for endocarditis. Now, why would it end up in the heart though? Well, it's pretty simple, really. If I am a bacterium, where would I find the best uh, food and house to live in you know, inside the patient's body? So it boils down to what does a bacterium need to live? Well, I'm a bacterium, so just like humans, I need sugar and I need oxygen. The best place to get that is the mitral valve. So uh, I... I, I can go to the mitral valve. I wouldn't want to stay in the tricuspid valve because the blood there doesn't have oxygen. So I'd go to the uh, mitral valve. So it's a perfect place. There's rough edges and surfaces on the, on the valve. So I can stick there. I can live there. Um, and I get the fir first dibs on oxygen and there's sugar there too. So that would be the best place to to live So that's what frequently happens. I'm not saying there won't be any endocarditis in the other valves however um, since again, basically it boils down to the the most 
conducive environment. So frequently it's the mitral valve that is affected. Vegetations are seen as they form on the mitral valve, frequently the mitral valve. Vegetations are, long story short, they're like debris after the battle. So this is um, a, co a combination of your immune system cells, you know, your white blood cells, platelets, and the bacteria. And there's also clots there. So um, they form these vegetations, um, and, but they're not permanent structures. Okay, so they just stick to the valve. However, they may they have the potential to break off because the the left ventricle isn't exactly a peaceful place. So this is a very violent environment. So the vegetations can potentially break off and become emboli. So this will. Uh, add to the problems that the patient will have. Let's go now to the signs and symptoms. There are manifestations that are exclusively seen in endocarditis. Two of them are the Osler's nodes and the Janeway's lesions here. They are respectively lesions. Both are red. Um, Osler's nodes are pain, painful and tender. Janeway's lesions are painless, but they all both they both look red. Okay, they are red spots, red lesions in the in the tips, in the hands and the feet. Um, there's also something seen on the eyes, the yeah, hemorrhagic lesions. Uh, we have splinter hemorrhages. So basically, these are caused by the microscopic emboli. The, the vegetative emboli, you know, they're so tiny that they'll end up in some tiny capillary, cause obstruction, and then uh, microscopic bleeding. Okay, so that's why these things appear red. Because there is valve damage as a result of the growth of the vegetation, the vegetative lesions, there will be a murmur heard so it will either stiffen or damage the, the valve so they become leaky now so if the patient has never had this problem you you'll hear a new murmur however if they've had one and then the the valve um, meaning a, a murmur is always caused by a, a leaky valve so meaning if they've had a murmur an existing murmur that means the valve is already leaking in the first place so if it worsens then the there will be a change in the uh, previous murmur uh, that change of course will be worse than the original and as already mentioned, there will be signs of embolization. So on top of these tiny, these are uh, harmless, by the way, because they're in non-vital organs. Um, however, embolization can also occur in um, other major organs. Okay, it could go to the brain, the heart, the GI organs, the kidneys. Um, however, it's important to note that these are not blood clots okay these these emboli are not thrombi these are vegetative lesions so um, giving an anticoagulant won't won't fix this okay um, we'll just rely on the body to eventually you know our macrophages to eat these because they're tiny uh, however if the patient suffers a stroke from it um, then it has to be addressed uh, stroke is managed in another chapter. Okay, how do we diagnose endocarditis? The a blood culture will confirm the the diagno the diagnosis. So we'll draw blood cultures, and if they grow the organism, there we go. We have a blood infection, and to confirm that. It is in the endocardium. We have to take a look at the endocardium. So a patient will have an echocardiogram. This will also help see if there, how much damage, if any, is made to the valve. Uh, because this is an infection, so in, in, on top of uh, increased WBC, the positive blood culture, there will also be 
elevated inflammatory markers just like any other infection so we have ESR and CRP elevations a common complication of this condition is heart failure because this causes valve damage and valve damage causes congestion because now you will disturb the unidirectional flow of blood so there will be blood either pooling in one or more chambers or blood um, regurgitating back to a previous chamber um, either way there is congestion which will lead to heart failure and because this affects the mitral valve so we're talking about left ventricular failure here on top of the acute uh, treatment for acute uh, endocarditis there will be prophylactic um, treatment as well okay so moving forward this should really be discussed uh, toward the end um, toward discharge but we can also discuss this here because this is prevention okay so who are at risk for endocarditis so we already talked about the portals of entry earlier so we said IV drug users, people with central lines, um, people who um, uh, have a um, had a prosthetic valve or a damaged valve, for instance. Okay, so our target are those same people who have the high risk. If a patient has any of these uh, procedures, oral. Uh, doesn't really matter where, whether the dental work is cleaning, you know, just prophylactic um, procedure, or if you had a, a root canal or um, a tooth extraction, it's a dental procedure. Reason is our mouth isn't the clean, exactly the cleanest part of our body, and it's very red. That's why our mucous membranes are red because they're very vascular. So you. You, if you injure a, a part of your body that is very vascular, that is also very dirty, then you have a high chance of getting an infection. The other conditions here, procedures here, respiratory procedures like a bronchoscopy, um, also the um, general surgery, um, they are not mentioned in other textbooks anymore. I don't know why uh, because the American Heart Association only recommends prophylactic antibiotic for oral or dental procedures. Um, however, your textbook still says this, so we'll follow it. So a respiratory tract in incisions will be included as well as oral surgeries. Uh, tonsillectomy and adenoid adenoidectomy uh, between them, tonsillectomy is the is the oral one. Uh, adenoidectomy, of course, is nasal, or which is respiratory. So before they get these any of these procedures done, they should tell their doctor or their dentist, and uh, so that they can have prophylactic antibiotics before the procedure, because again, they could develop endocarditis as a result. Because this is an infection and because the patient develops heart failure as a result because of the valve damage, so first things first, we give the patient antibiotics. For a, um, you know, the, the most common organisms are either staph or uh, streptococcus, so they receive four to six weeks of IV antibiotics. Um, because this is now long-term antibiotic therapy, we just learned in uh, IV module, ATI uh, uh, skills module IV therapy, that long-term antibiotic therapy is an indication for a central line. So the patient will, ha will need a central line. So now on top of the antibiotic infusion, uh, you are also responsible for monitoring the uh, venous central venous access device and uh, changing the dressings uh, and then keeping in mind that this is another portal of entry possibly 
patient could get another infection to the central line. Uh, what's written here is the, the six weeks here or more is only for the endocarditis caused by fungi or those um, organisms that uh, don't respond very well to anti IV antibiotic therapy. Um, so uh, the treatment will be longer. Um, but generally speaking, if it's staph or um, strep, um, then it's uh, four to six weeks of IV, IV antibiotics. Because the patient is sick, so um, some of the signs and symptoms, of course, which I didn't discuss here. So the patient is sick. Okay, so typical signs and symptoms of somebody who has an infection. So here, so um, you don't feel well, you have body aches, fever, don't no appetite. Okay, nothing new. All right, so besides treating the infection, we also give them symptomatic treatment. So uh, no Tylenol for the fever. And of course, don't forget this patient develops heart failure. So we already discussed chapter 34, heart failure. So this patient will receive um, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, etc. Okay, um, very important before you discharge these patients, tell them again the prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, avoid people with infections. The patient technically is not infectious, um, but they are prone to infections. Okay. So you just uh, put them on um, standard precautions. Unless the causative organism is MRSA, then that's a different story. So here's the standard treatment. It's four to six weeks. Again, it's longer if the organism is um, you know, either drug resistant or is caused by fungal infection. All right, because of the embolization here, again, remember that the emboli are not blood clots. They're, uh, they're vegetative emboli. So monitor them for those complications of a stroke, pulmonary edema resulting from heart failure. And here, so don't forget the care for the central line. Okay, very important. Not all patients will be kept in the hospital for the duration of the four to six weeks of antibiotics because that's all they they need. There's really no other care um, uh, unless they need the, the valve is so the valve damage is so severe then they'll have to stay for uh, valve replacement or valve repair, right? So that's on top of having the uh, infection. Uh, they typically don't do the surgery until the patient has the infection cleared. Okay, it's uh, it's it's not good to it's not the best idea to do surgery during an active infection. And that's about it for uh, endocarditis. So again, this it's an infection. However, it causes valve damage and therefore it will cause heart failure so you manage heart failure you already know how to do that and just remember the teaching you know the prophylactic antibiotics because once you have had an endocarditis <clears throat> you will be prone to another one okay so know the risk factors who are at risk and again the um, important thing the importance of prophylactic antibiotics before any oral dental procedures <clears throat> So this time, the infection is not on the innermost lining, but on the outermost lining. So this is now the pericarditis. It can also be caused by infectious causes, bacterial, fungal, viral, um, or protozoan. Okay? But the other causes are the following. We have uh, non-infectious causes, namely an MI. 
we also have lupus lupus <clears throat> or um, lupus is a uh, autoimmune connective tissue disorder because the pericardium is a connective tissue that's why it's affected during a lupus um, exacerbation okay, so lupus is another chronic condition which is you know it has remissions and they also have um, exacerbations just like heart failure and COPD so these are the non-infectious causes we mentioned uh, acute MI and I did mention this during the uh, chapter 33 recording um, another it will really depends on uh, when after the MI this pericarditis developed if it occurs within one to two days after an MI because there's the dead tissue there so there will be necrosis inflammation therefore around the dead tissue if you have a MI uh, so it will it will cause the pericardium to inflame however if the if the um, pericarditis occurs weeks later after an MI we call it Dressler's syndrome other causes are post pericardiotomy syndrome this is a procedure done to uh, relieve let's say after open-heart surgery you have a, a blocked um, um, chest tube you know you have a fluid accumulation there so the doctor will poke a hole there through the pericardium and this is one another cause of pericarditis rheumatic fever which we'll discuss toward the end of this chapter is another cause then so here's lupus okay and um, scleroderma also and even in rheumatoid arthritis okay so what are the patient's symptoms so this is what it looks like it looks very painful because uh, imagine this is the sac surrounding the heart um, the the heart will be beating constantly it won't stop beating throughout this ordeal so just like you guys uh, women specifically i know um, during my college days you know i know women when they go party you know they get new shoes high heels like that um, even if they didn't have a chance to break them in nah, they continue to dance Okay, so most uh, females develop a blister, right, uh, on the heel, but um, I've never seen it stop them from partying, you know, they still get on the ledge, dance. So the um, blister gets worse, okay, so there's more and more fluid that develops there. So same thing here, so you have a, a sac around the heart, which is already inflamed. And then the heart continues to beat against it. So the heart will continue to rub against it. The, no, normally, the fluid around the, the sac, around the pericardium, is only about maybe 10 ml. Um, however, if it's now inflamed and then you have a heart beating, rubbing against it constantly, uh, not only will there be excruciating pain, but there will be some fluid accumulation there. So here are our manifestations. The patient's number one concern, of course, is the pain. They could care less about the other complications. So the patient will complain of pleuritic chest pain. This is this is severe, sharp pain, um, getting worse during inspiration. You know, of course, the if you have the lungs um, on each side. So let's say. This is your heart, and this is the inflamed pericardium containing fluid, and then you have the right and the left lung. So that's why during inspiration, of course, this is the mediastinum right here. So this is the the chest. Um, the the heart and the lungs have to share the space, and this is the only space occupied by the heart. So every time the patient inhales of course that will squeeze the inflamed inflamed pericardium against the heart so that will cause considerable pain um, and uh, later also I'll, I'll show you uh, I'll mention it when we get to the to cardiac tamponade later 
Okay, so the hallmark finding is the pericardial friction rub, and there's a uh, um, suggestion here how to tell uh, pericardial from pleural friction rub because they sound exactly the same. So please read that on your own. So there are two major complications here. One actually develops into the other. So if the fluid accumulation inside the pericardium is about 50 ml, we call that pericardial effusion now because that's quite a lot of fluid already. Remember, the heart only stays in the small space called the, the mediastinum. If you add fluid around the uh, inside that sac around the heart, it, it's not like it's going to um, expand the, the mediastinum. Okay, so the heart has to share the space with the lungs. It can only beat in that small area. So if you increase the fluid inside the pericardium, as a result, the more fluid is around the heart, the smaller the space for the heart to expand, okay, to move around, and the greater the pressure. So if you imagine, in cardiac tamponade, so here is your heart. And here is now, let's say we have a lot of fluid now inside the, the, um, the pericardium. And then you have the superior and the inferior vena cava here. Then the lungs, right and left lungs. So with all this fluid now around the heart, what will happen to the amount of venous return? Of course, that will decrease because now essentially the the pressure building up in the inside the pericardium with more than 50 ml of fluid there that fluid by the way could be uh, serious fluid you know just clear fluid um, or it could be blood already it could be bleeding so that will decrease venous return venous return will decrease Therefore, less blood in, there will be less blood out. So there will be decreased cardiac output, decreased blood pressure. And because this is the superior vena cava we're talking about, this is the major vessel draining blood from your upper extremities and your head. So there will be distension eventually of the jugular vein. So this now accounts for your symptoms here. So we said there's decreased cardiac output the heart sounds will feel muffled or they sound very far distant because when you put your stethoscope here you are listening um, uh, to a to a heart which is drowning in fluid so therefore instead of listening directly to the heart you're listening over the fluid so the sounds will be muffled there will be narrow pulse pressure narrow pulse pressure the pulse pressure is the um, difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressure because there's very high uh, there's again the heart is squeezed here so there will be very little difference between systolic and the diastolic pressure uh, especially if the blood pressure already drops there will also be tachycardia of course that will be in response to the decreased cardiac output that's compensation I already mentioned the uh, jugular vein distension Okay, so if you see these symptoms in a patient with pericarditis, which is most likely to happen, the first thing you do is call the doctor. Because there's nothing you can do. He has to drain that fluid. So uh, cardiac tamponade is a life-threatening emergency. So again, this is, um, this is likely to occur, okay? So this is a complication though. This is not the same as the pericardial friction rub. The pericardial friction rub here is, is expected, okay? This is li not life-threatening because this is just the pain the patient feels because again, the, the pericardium is very inflamed and the heart continues to beat against that inflamed uh, sac. This one, is a life-threatening complication um, wherein you have now fluid increasing fluid a fluid buildup inside the pericardium um, 
I don't need to test this. Uh, the only thing you need to know about Paulson's paradoxes is the definition is there's higher bl uh, blood pressure during exhalation and lower during inhalation. Because if you follow these steps, it's quite um, complicated to do. Um, yeah, so if you ever get a question, that's what it means. Paulson's paradoxes is your blood pressure is slightly higher on exhalation and lower during inhalation for obvious reasons. Diagnostic studies. So we still need, just like endocarditis, we need an echo. Uh, we also need, um, uh, well, depending really on the cause of the pericarditis, if it's lupus, of course, we know that the patient's having a lupus exacerbation or the patient had an MI. So treatment is based on the cause. So if it's infectious, it's bacterial, then we give antibiotics. If it's fungal, we give antifungal, etc. All right, because there is inflammation, so you'll expect uh, increase in WBC, and again, of your inflammatory markers, CRP and ESR will also rise. There is troponin level. Uh, elevation here um, in uh, acute pericarditis, pericarditis, especially of course if the page if the cause is an MI. Um, so the patient has pain, so of course we will give uh, NSAIDs, uh, just like in endocarditis. Why not opioids in both? By the way, because this is inflammatory in nature. So NSAIDs work better compared to uh, opioids. Um, like I said, the treatment will depend on the, the cause. So if it's uh, bacterial, they get antibiotics. If, um, oh, by the way, if it's bacterial, it's not a great idea to add NSAIDs. So NSAIDs, as stated here, is only reserved for patients whose pericarditis cause or trigger is lupus then you'll be hitting two birds with one stone there so no steroids if the patient's uh, cause of the pericarditis is bacterial no, no of course you can't give uh, both at the same time because that will just be counterproductive okay you are suppressing the immune system at the same time that you're giving antibiotics um, Okay, we already said this, that treat the underlying cause and said steroids again, except if um, there's a bacterial cause. Okay, so um, we recognize the cardiac tamponade. We haven't discussed how to treat it yet. So we said you saw the muffled heart sounds, JVD, pulses, paradoxes, uh, what else? Um, tachycardia, hypotension. Okay, so you saw it in a patient with pericarditis. That only means they're developing cardiac tamponade so you call the doctor right so you prepare for pericardiosynthesis so the doctor will insert a um about an 18 gauge about eight to ten inch long uh, needle and insert it right here Okay, so he'll need, of course, ultrasound guidance for this because he might go too deep. Uh, he has to know where he's going um, and drain the fluid. Um, take note that anticoagulants are not a good idea for pericarditis because of the danger of cardiac tamponade. So you may develop uh, bleeding in there and then you'll have blood accumulating in the pericardium. If the cause for some reason ends up wherein the pleural effusion will be recurrent, meaning um, after we drain it once, it will reaccumulate. So it wouldn't make sense stabbing the patient repeatedly uh, for pericardiosynthesis. So the better idea would be, meaning if it's likely to recur, we, the doctor will perform a pericardial window it's simply uh, making an incision uh, like a window you know cutting a hole in the pericardium 
allowing the fluid to drain continuously either into the peritoneum or into um, the the um, what is this the uh, the peritoneum oh no I already said peritoneum or to the chest okay so it will just drain down by gravity peritoneum is in the abdomen uh, it's better there because you have more uh, give in the abdomen uh, plus you won't have symptoms you know no shortness of breath no uh, cardiac output problems if the water settles in the abdomen and it's not like it's a lot of fluid okay because the pericardium is so just a small area that's why it's a problem there but you have plenty of space in the peritoneum so it's not likely to cause problems there um please read the rest on your own i've pretty much covered the most important part um because this management here again is based on the cost this is cost specific oh the uh, non-pharmacologic um, management for the pleuritic chest pain is positioning so it was described in the um, at the beginning of uh, pericarditis uh, and it's mentioned here again so we of course since this position here relieves the pain so that's how we relieve it so we ask the patient to uh, lean over a table maybe you know and, and then lean forward okay that position brings the the um the ribs kind of off the you know because because when you're laying down of course the heart falls back against the by gravity onto your spine and uh, of course your, your your ribs will also um, uh, put pressure on it so therefore if you lay, lay uh, lean forward that will kind of take the pressure off it won't 100% um, make the pain disappear but it's a more comfortable position we will not test or discuss chronic pericarditis uh, myocarditis i won't spend too much time on this because really this is inflammation of the myocardium which is pretty much the same as having a heart attack without the um uh, what is this without the troponins because there's really no uh, infarction involved here but because it's uh, inflammation of the myocardium there may be some increase in myoglobin Okay, but not probably not uh, troponins. So I'll skip through that because if you look at it, management is really the same as heart failure, because this is the heart muscle that is inflamed. Okay, let's go to the next one: rheumatic fever. So rheumatic fever and rheumatic disease are connected. So as defined here, rheumatic fever is the acute problem. Okay, so you have an infection. The causative in, uh, organism here is the streptococcus, the same streptococcus that causes strep throat. So this is a consequence if you either do not treat strep throat or you undertreat it. So let's say you were diagnosed and it, you didn't finish the antibiotic, then you will develop rheumatic fever. It doesn't stop there though because rheumatic fever usually ends up with rheumatic heart disease in rheumatic heart disease this is now the chronic problem because the 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 rheumatic fever results in your immune system attacking the um your, your valve you know because the strep uh organism has a protein this is their theory anyway um the the the, the protein on the on the strep is similar to some proteins found in the heart tissue so the the your immune cells um, mistake it so they end up attacking the the, the heart and the, and the valves unfortunately so th that would be the cause of the deformity of the heart valve so they have damage now so this why this is why this is one of those conditions that require uh, prophylactic antibiotics because again this causes damage to the valve 
um, making them at risk for endocarditis. Plus, there's damage to the valve, so again, this might end up with heart failure again. So, in short, all the conditions you talk about in chapter 36 all end up having heart failure. Right, we already said this, it um, does its damage on the valves, but um, treatment, since this is a strep infection, so it's treated with antibiotics, uh, not IV though, this will be PO, you know, like how you treat pen, um, uh, strep throat, it's treated with um, penicillin, okay, oral, uh, oral antibiotics, so that's all we do. Um, because they develop heart failure then you also add now treatment for heart failure and the same you know diagnostic um, testing to determine um, valve damage okay and if needed then we repair them um, don't bother don't hurt yourselves with table 36-7 i'm not testing this Okay, complications, as already mentioned, this will cause considerable damage to the valves and therefore a patient will have heart failure and therefore will require uh, valve repair or valve replacement. And again, putting them at risk for endocarditis, so don't forget the prophylactic antibiotics before any oral or dental procedures. Okay. And then uh, they, they do have pain. Again, this is uh, inflammatory in nature, so they can get NSAIDs. Next topic is... Okay. Oh, uh, please read this part. This is, again, about um, discharge. So the we mentioned that the patient um, needs prophylactic antibiotics, right? Okay, so this is how long they will uh, require the um, prophylactic antibiotics. So this would be um, minimum five years. Uh, this is if the patient is at this age. Okay, so it occurs as a young person. Um, so they require the prophylaxis until age 20 and um, five years onward. Okay. If the patient or already has here, if there's valve damage, then it will be lifelong antibiotic prophylaxis. And same thing teaching for uh, endocarditis, you know, um, good oral care, hygiene. Um, this is the second to the last valve a valvular heart disease there are two major problems here either the heart valves do not completely open or they do not completely close so here is a stenose obviously this is uh, what they call fish lip it's uh, it, it doesn't close and then this is um, um, a valve that doesn't um, doesn't completely open i mean that doesn't completely close this one doesn't completely open this one doesn't completely close all right so this is the uh, illustration um the book only focuses on mitral and aortic uh, for obvious reasons these are the most crucial valves uh, in no way does that mean the tricuspid and pulmonic valves are chopped liver okay so they also mentioned it in the table uh, but the more serious ones are those on the left so here's the condition so this is the illustration of how this thing causes congestion and therefore heart failure so this is a stenosed valve so as the left atrium contracts it cannot fill the ventricle enough so there will be congestion here and then here very little ventricular filling so cardiac output suffers so you can imagine 
how serious this is you know no cardiac output there um, or very little and then this one isn't any better because now there is uh, congestion here because you're you're uh, every time the um, the um, ventricle contracts there will be blood going back to the left atrium so although there is still cardiac output here but it'll be uh, definitely less than it should be so in either way cardiac output suffers this one though will um, have pulmonary congestion symptoms as well I'm not saying this won't because as this uh, uh, as this progresses you know every time uh, this contracts more blood is is pushed back against the into the left atrium so this will also cause pulmonary congestion eventually uh, long story short it's going to cause heart failure okay, so I won't do so much on the manifestations because we already know this will be heart failure uh, it's also easy to remember so the mitral valve is obviously on the left side so what type of heart failure symptoms will you see left side so you always have fatigue shortness of breath um, um, uh, as you can see there's no peripheral edema because these are on the left side on the right side on the other hand so the tricuspid and the pulmonic valves are on the right side so that's why you have here your signs of right-sided heart failure and that's it because the only uh, management here is because the patient has heart failure so you treat them with doables and surgical management of course will be to repair or replace the valve here are teachings specific to mitral valve prolapse of all the valve disorders this is the um, least problem of all uh, they typically are asymptomatic for a long period of time usually they become systematic uh, symptomatic if they develop other diseases like hypertension for instance where in the heart the strain on the heart now increases then the MVP becomes a problem but if the patients otherwise healthy and they only have MVP they rarely have symptoms okay please watch these drug alerts okay I think that's about it yeah I'm not testing any of these just know that valve uh, the signs and symptoms of valvular disorders and then the treatment I mean med medication drug therapy is uh, a bit the same as in chapter 34 and you already know that uh, valve repair I'm not testing any of the intra-op procedures only pre and post-op and uh, we already discussed repeatedly the the need for prophylactic antibiotics again uh, remember endocarditis okay oh um if the patient receives a mechanical valve here I almost forgot uh, then uh, part of the therapy will be anticoagulation because um, mechanical valves tend to um, form clots so here we have long-term um, uh, anticoagulation if they have AFib okay so this is for biologics so that's the only time a biologic valve replacements receive anticoagulation okay but it's standard if the patient has um, mechanical valve so here right here okay okay so uh, mechanical valves typically require lifelong anticoagulation um, as mentioned here biologic valves do not require anti anticoagulation however if the patient with a biologic valve develops 
uh, atrial fibrillation, then that's the only time they'll require long-term anticoagulation. Um, that's it. Let's go to the last one now, cardiomyopathy. Okay. Um, this is a unfortunate heart disease resulting in a, a structural defect of the of the heart there is I mean you can manage this because basically the patient develops heart failure so you do the usual um, treatment for um, heart failure a patient with heart failure which is your doable and um, hope that they can get a heart transplant because that, that's the only cure for this disease these are the identified causes of cardiomyopathy for each type um, I'm not testing these okay this is just nice to know um, nor the specific symptoms because again uh, cardiomyopathy results in heart failure so our our diagnostic testing management is really the same look at this one diagnostic testing so here's BNP because again the patient develops heart failure so there will be congestion the patient goes into heart failure so same thing management the same thing here these are the medications for uh, heart failure uh, anticoagulation if needed because these patients um, have chronic congestion so they may develop dysrhythmias afib for instance right here afib so if they have afib then you add anticoagulants as i already mentioned they will need heart transplantation that will be the only cure and that's it for chapter 34